I am going to, when you start talking. Yeah, I would stay. Hi, good morning, good afternoon. Hello. I'm Jeffrey Stanton. I'm the Communications and External Relations Manager here at Harvard Medical School. Uh, I work with Gina Vild, uh, who is here. For those who you who will miss her introduction, she'll be back at the next time. Um, I also coordinate this series of Talks at 12. Uh, our monthly Talks at 12 series offers timely discuss discussions with experts from HMS and our affiliates on science, research, and health issues that impact all of our lives. Welcome everyone here in our Harvard Medical School campus and those who are watching on live stream. Um, after our, a brief hiatus, we'll be back with our next Talks at 12 on August 27th, uh, discussing food and mood, diet as a complementary method for healing. So mark your calendar. Uh, today's program is LGBTQ and A. So our panel encourages your cues after the presentation. For those watching the live stream, submit your questions uh, on the HMS Facebook page or YouTube channel by adding your questions to the comment section below the video. We're, uh, we're very excited to kick off the, the month of LGBTQ pride with this afternoon's discussion <clears throat> on uh, the health and wellness concerns of the LGBT community and all the ways that each of us can help foster a more inclusive environment in our workplace, in healthcare, and beyond. Uh, if I may, I'd like to share a personal story uh, before we kick off our presentation today. Uh, before I was a member of the HMS communications team, I was an undergraduate in Boston in the early 90s. <laughs> not all that long ago, uh, just out. AIDS loomed large in our daily lives and our imaginations. <clears throat> Misinformation was still very rampant. On a trip home to New Jersey, I went to see my primary care doctor for a routine checkup. With sheer terror, I asked for my first HIV test. He asked, why? I hedged with a lie about a requirement for a college health services uh, form. My sexual orientation was not invited into the room. It was mortifying. The result was delivered a week later, not to me, directly to my mom on her answering machine. I became an advocate for LGBTQ patients, uh, doctors for LGBTQ, uh, doctors for patients. How else could we speak freely, trust in someone without the same experience, truly feel cared for as a whole person? We have come a long way. We have marriage rights. We have anti-discrimination protections, although we must stay vigilant to maintain them. We have LGBTQ doctors for LGBTQ patients, and we have more informed, therefore more compassionate physicians who do care for the needs of all. I'm proud to be a part of Harvard Medical School. Core to its mission, HMS fosters an open, affirming, and welcoming community for all students, staff, faculty, trainees, and fellows. Harvard Medical School is a leader in addressing sexual and gender minority health concerns. 
Five years ago, Harvard led the way in allowing medical school applicants to self-identify as LGBTQ, and the current first-year class is 11% LGBTQ. More than 300 faculty, staff, postdocs, and trainees have joined the Harvard Outlist, which began five years ago with just a few dozen people. Those who have added their names are either LGBTQ or allies, all interested in mentoring or connecting with others seeking better patient care and research. And Harvard Medical School recently received an historic $1.5 million gift to integrate sexual and gender minority health matters into our undergraduate medical school curriculum. We look forward to spending the next three years creating a roadmap that could serve as a model for other medical schools. Now for the presentation. Today's moderator, Jessica Hallam, is the LGBTQ Outreach and Engagement Director for Harvard Medical School and remains the only person with that role among US medical schools. She is a sought out speaker nationally on issues of workplace diversity and inclusion and in her spare time, I don't know how you have spare time. She is an improv comedian. <laughs> she is joined by uh, Cecil Webster, who serves as part-time lecturer in psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and works as an adult, adolescent, and child psychiatrist at McLean Hospital. And Sari Reisner, who serves as an assistant professor in pediatrics at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School in the Department of Epidemi Epidemiology at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. Please give them a warm welcome. Oh my goodness, um, what an exciting day this is. I, uh, I often get to say that I am the luckiest lesbian who works on Longwood, <laughs> and uh, today is one of those days. Uh, I am here in a room full of current medical students, faculty, staff, postdocs, um, other trainees. Who else is here in the room with us? Librarians, right? Who else? What did I miss? Right? Lots of LGBTQ people are here, lots of allies. Um, it is an honor and a pleasure uh, to get to do this work. I stand on the shoulders of so many people here at Harvard, here in Boston, throughout the US, who have been working in this world of healthcare equity uh, for decades and decades. And we're gonna touch on a little bit of where we have been, how we got here, and the work that is left to be done. My hope for today is to get you so excited about this topic that you want to do more. You want to learn more as a physician for your practice. You want to become a doctor yourself. You want to become a healthcare provider. You want to uh, uh, figure out ways to do more research and care for LGBTQ people. That's our goal today. Get excited and do more, all right? So let's start off. Oh, that's me. This is me. Please be in touch. This is what I get to do. Harvard Medical School was like, let's find a big loudmouth lesbian who will answer all of your questions. And that's what I'm here to do. I am merely the band leader. I am merely the band leader who gets to orchestrate an incredible, as you heard, hundreds and hundreds of faculty and students and staff who are so excited about doing this work and are here to serve and to do more. So please be in touch. Oh, Bush, we're going to get right into it. It's an exciting day at Harvard when we get to talk about sex <laughs> and gender, right? It's an exciting day at Harvard when we get to talk about sex. And then as part of, you know, I just want to take a moment and deal with honor. It's, that's kind of the, uh, that's the big part of this work, is that we are talking about things that sometimes we don't talk about <laughs> nine to five in the workplace. We don't talk about and think about uh, potentially with our doctors, right? That's what we're trying to, to work on, right? We're trying to tackle subjects that are either hard to talk about, difficult to talk about, traumatic. Um, we're trying to really get to the bottom of it and make it an open and affirming environment uh, on all of these subjects. So let's talk about language. What do I hear? What's the first thing I hear all the time in doing this? Number one question I get, oh, my assistant's helping me. Hold on. My mouth isn't that loud, I guess. I needed a better microphone. Thank you. Um, I want to start with language. Let's just start with language. This is what matters, right? 
What are the words that people have chosen to use to describe themselves? What are the words that people are sharing with you that they would like you to refer to them as? What are the words that people are putting on posters and t-shirts and uh, in their profiles, right? And many of you come to me and say, with love in your hearts, gosh, there's a lot of language. There's a lot of new words. How can I keep up with all this terminology? I'm messing up all the time. And the short answer is, yep, you're going to mess up. It's changing. It's new. But at the core, I want to say this. This is your number one takeaway around language. Language is changing and developing and growing because we have more to describe who we are and who we always have been. Language is merely new to describe who we've always been. We've always been here. LGBTQ people, transgender people, non-binary people, asexual people have always existed in every culture and every time period. And the language has changed. But that's just it. The language changes. The people have not. And the exciting part is that we're in a time where people are feeling more free and open to share with you the words that are important to them. So when someone shares a new word to describe themselves to you, I want you to look at it as an opportunity for a deeper connection and an authentic moment, right? And I want you to practice saying the words. This is the fun part. You get to go home in the shower and practice saying lesbian, <laughs> transgender, bisexual, right? Gay. Gay's a good one. Gay, right? Gay, lesbians. Bisexuals, transgender people, queers. What's on the other side of this slide? Lots of other language we use to describe ourselves. And I could have 10 more slides um, with lots of exciting new language that people use to describe themselves. Um, I hope in the Facebook people are adding in words that they use to describe themselves. Again, language changes. We got to practice saying it. When you have an opportunity to say, I support the LGBTQ community, or whatever version of the acronym you're using. I want you to say it with, I want you to say it with confidence, right? I want you to say it with security and, and pride that you know what each letter of that acronym stands for, right? And if we keep adding letters, that just means that more people are inviting you to know them better. It's an exciting time. Um, it's an exciting time. Lots of new language to learn, um, getting to know people better. Here's some statistics. We wouldn't be Harvard if I didn't share statistics with you. And these, don't, uh, these come out of a wonderful organization, GLAAD. There's lots of different ways we can find. How many people are we talking about, Jessica? This isn't a lot of people. Why do we talk about this so much? Um, there's a lot of different ways we could sort of slice and dice. Who? How many LGBTQ people are there in the United States around the world? These are the kind of numbers we need to find out more about, right? We need to uh, do more research. But one of the numbers I'd like to share with you shows it by generation, right? Because this is really happening, people. It's happening. This is not a drill. The kids are queer. The kids are non-binary. They're here, and they're going to grow up with us, all right? So look at this. What does it say? 18 to 34 year olds are identifying and telling you that they are part of the LGBTQ community in big numbers. And you heard earlier that the first year class at Harvard Medical School is 11% LGBTQ. And I'm excited to tell you for the first time what next year's class number is going to be 15% of the <laughs> incoming class at Harvard Medical School this August identify as LGBTQ. It's happening. The world is changing, and we're excited to have to catch up with the young people, right? Am I right? So how did we get here? Uh, you know, here we are at, at Pride. Um, you're going to hear a lot about the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising, and I invite you all to learn more about Stonewall and the incredible brave souls in New York City 50 years ago. There's lots of work that's gone into this moment, right? I don't, you know, Harvard Medical School didn't just pop up and hire Jessica Hallam. A lot of people have worked hard to make this a more inclusive and welcoming place, right? A lot of people have fought to get somebody like me here. 
And what do I stand on the shoulders of? We stand on the shoulders, on one hand, lots of legal issues. The Supreme Court has a series of cases. Again, write these down. You can learn more. This is exciting. Here we are, noon on a Thursday, talking about sodomy. Who knew we were going to talk about sodomy today, right? <laughs> You can't do a queer talk and not talk about sodomy. Anti-sodomy laws were at the heart of some of the worst discrimination that LGBTQ people were facing. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting history in the United States and around the world. I invite you to learn more about how sodomy laws have been used uh, to, to, as really the legal framework uh, for discriminating against us. So you can sort of see, well, why did I start with Roe v. Wade? Right? How did, why did I start with Roe v. Wade? And at the core, Roe v. Wade is a Supreme Court decision based upon the right to privacy. And many of the LGBTQ Supreme Court cases and laws that we have today really um, build upon this fundamental right to privacy. So I, I invite that into this conversation as you think about how did we get here. I invite you to remember the right to privacy is at the core of this. Isn't that an interesting? Um, and then of course you see we end in 2015 with marriage equality. I never would have imagined as a lesbian I'd be up here talking about marriage and children as much as I am. I thought it was gonna be a life on the road, you know, from one dark bar to the next. <laughs> Living a life on the run, right? Here I am at Harvard. Married, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Stonewall. Next slide, DSM. I'm going to move quickly. Uh, here we are in, this, in the heart of medicine. This is an incredible history. I urge you to learn it. The history of how the DSM has changed. This, this is a cornerstone of our work here in medicine. And the story of how the DSM changed around homosexuality and transgender people is a fascinating history. And this is a wonderful uh, 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 place to dive in. We've got legal rights, and then we've got sort of the role of medicine. And something I want to point out to all of the doctors and the doctors in training. In 1972, when homosexuality was finally removed, as a sociopathic disorder, it was years of advocacy, incredible advocates that had been working on that. And then one of the interesting nuggets from that story that I want to share with you doctors and doctors in training to be in the audience is that it was when gay psychiatrists came out to their colleagues that really we saw a sea change. We really saw the change happen when still in hiding, when other psychiatrists raised their hand and said to their straight colleagues, I am gay, you are talking about your colleagues. So I, I invite you to noodle on that, doctors. What personal story in your life could change medicine for the better, right? That's a wonderful aspect to this. We wouldn't be here if I didn't mention the NIH, the important leadership that the NIH has played in getting us to a, a place where we're talking about uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender health. In 2011, a landmark <coughs> report came out. It's still a bedrock of the work that we do. Um, the IOM, now called the Academy of Sciences, I think. OK, someone will correct me. Um, uh, came, the landmark production, uh, publication 2011, you can uh, find it online. This remains an important framework for our work. Look, Harvard people, get excited. Here's a framework. This is, this is still uh, one of our guiding principles on how we like to think about LGBTQ health, right? It's got the, our, what the research needs are, patient care needs, thinking about all of the ways that you could dive into this. I bet everyone in this audience could see themselves and their work somewhere in this NIH framework, and I invite you to get excited and see how you, whether you're LGBT or straight, this is a chance for you to really get involved in an exciting uh, aspect of medicine. It's here, it's happening. Lots of wonderful folks at Harvard Medical School are doing some incredible work. Um, okay, let's talk about sex. Real quick, everybody's got one. Surprise, not just LGBTQ people. Everybody listening to this has a sexuality. And here at Harvard, we use an evidence-based model and, of course, a Venn diagram as we enjoy Venn diagrams. <laughs> uh, nothing sexier than a Venn diagram, am I right? This really says sex up there. Um, but again, 
think about this, really sit with this. We work with doctors. I, I, I work, I spend a lot of my time helping uh, healthcare providers create a more inclusive and understanding practice with their patients. And this is one of the core principles that we really need for them to understand. Everybody has a multidimensional sexuality and sexual orientation. And it, can, it takes many different forms. And sometimes they all line up cleanly and sometimes they don't. And you can look at this slide and you can see, right, I'm looking at my medical students, there's a lot in here that you can imagine as a healthcare provider you need to think about. Not only do you want to know how I personally identify, but then you also need to step to the next step and say, and who are you having sex with? Who are you having sex with? What's going where, when, and what do I need to swab? <laughs> yeah, it's okay, you could laugh at that one. That was a good one, right? Gender, everyone has one. Part of the reason why we're in a messy situation that we're unpacking today is that for too long, we have conflated sexual orientation and gender identity. Let me say that again. For too long, we've conflated sexual orientation and gender identity. They are two parts of our lives, um, two very rich parts. And again, this is even a more complicated Venish diagram. So at the core, this is something, again, we could, we could spend an hour talking about this, but at the core, this is something everyone needs to understand. We, we, we have a sex assigned at birth. Um, a, a topic for another conversation would really be talking about our uh, friends who are intersex. We're not going to get to that today. But to understand, our sex assigned at birth is different than our gender identity. The sex that I am assigned at birth is different than the gender identity to which I live today, right? I identify as a woman, and I personally was assigned female at birth. So I would say, right, I'm female, sex assigned at birth, and I identify as a, a, as a woman. My gender expression, I use words like femme to describe myself. And everyone's got this, right? And this is an exciting opportunity. Again, you can think about patients and young people and to see where's the conflict? Where's the anxiety? How can I support you? Where do you need an advocate? You know, how does this change over a lifetime, right? Asking every patient every time, right? Uh, how does this change over the course of a lifetime? And then, of course, gender perception. How are people receiving you? Is that going well? Is that stressful? How the heck is sexism playing into your life? We think a lot here at Harvard around making our spaces more transgender and non-binary inclusive. We still have a lot of work to do, but we want to make sure that that gender binary, right, that you uh, are familiar with, the binary of male and female, where are we consciously and unconsciously creating barriers for transgender people and non-binary people to fully participate. So I'm proud to show you that's the signage we use here at Harvard Medical School for bathrooms. Very exciting talking about bathrooms all day long. I just <laughs> love it. Couldn't be more important, right? And I want to offer some conversations about language. Again, we're touching on many different subjects. You're all getting so excited. There's so much to learn. But one of the offerings that I have is just thinking about some of the language we use on an everyday basis, we, where we just unnecessarily gender everything. You know, it's, it, it becomes a habit, right? Hey, ladies, hey, girls, you know, oh, oh, it's a meeting of all women. Let's talk about our children, right? You know, where are we unwittingly gendering moments that is unnecessary and also potentially harmful when we don't know what people's gender identity is, what their identity is, right? How they want to be seen and, and, and respected, especially in a workplace setting. But you can imagine for patients. So I offer this as a wonderful example. Great folks out of Canada put this together. Um, some great examples of gender inclusive language. I bet we could come up with 10 more examples. I love this. I love the idea of thinking about everyday ways our language could be more expansive uh, and inclusive and, and almost, you know, uh, not gendering everybody. Oh, I guess that's the end of my slides. All right. Well, well, that was terrific. Well, I just basically <laughs> told you everything I do for a living in 20 minutes. So let's turn it over now to two incredible members of our faculty. I have the incredible pleasure of working with these. No, what am I doing? I, thank you. Medical student just asked for the slides. <laughs> That's what medical students do. They want the slides. I love it. I think that we'll probably, we can put them on the Facebook or, they'll be on Facebook. Yeah. And, and I know 
where to find you. Um, but thank you for liking my slides. When medical students like your slides, you know you've come far. <laughs> I, um, I wanted to touch on many different subjects today. I invited Dr. Webster to join us, who works especially with young people in a therapeutic setting. And I wanted to ask you, especially thinking about the doctors and the doctors in training in the audience, how to build and have an inclusive, respectful practice. Yeah, that's a, it's a very good question. Um, young people are often quite savvy, yeah. challenging at times, um, and really quite dynamic and curious. So if we can tap into some of that, then we have a real shot at being able to be more curious with them and get a deeper understanding of their lives and their, their families, et cetera. Um, it, it, per, it also presents some challenges as well. Yeah. Like as physicians, we are often taught in a very pathology model, like mm -hmm. when do things go wrong? Um, how, do we, how do we diagnose things in certain ways? Right. Rather than um, more of a strength-based um, orientation, what's going right in people's lives? Right. How do they see themselves? Where are their supports? Um, so it, it can be a difficult balance at times, but I, I try to think of things internally and also think about things externally. So externally, that would be things like my office, be, before people even come to see me, before I see them in the hospital or in my office or at the bedside or what have you. Um, and also internally, what's happening um, inside of them uh, that we may elucidate, things that we may find out. So externally, uh, you touched on some very important points, like we have made huge cultural strides mm -hmm. uh, in America in terms of um, LGBTQ acceptance, um, even affirmation, uh, celebration. Uh, we're here in Pride Month, of course. Uh, but there are also really thin protections for people, if at all, in places like the school, uh, yeah. places in uh, like work and other things. Oftentimes young people especially don't have a lot of reflections of themselves um, mm -hmm. at their schools or perhaps at home or in their communities, on television even. Although again, these are often places that they make uh, significant strides. So that is to say that young people especially, um, all people in general may have a lot of wariness before they come to see me. Right. And they also may right. see me that, uh, for reasons that have very little or nothing to do with their gender expression or identity or their sexual orientation. So it's really tricky. That's, that's the short version of all of that. Uh, but I think about um, what happens before people come to see me. Yeah. So I look around my office. I'm like, OK, all right. Are there like LGBT, LGBTQ inclusive symbols? Like, uh, will, Can I communicate to people that right. this is a place that I am open, willing, even enthusiastic about talking about these things. Uh, I've got like a little toy unicorn, for example. Yeah. Pride Month, we have Cute. small uh, uh, rainbow flags, et cetera. Uh, but again, all sort of symbols that this may be an OK place uh, to discuss something that's on their mind. Um, in addition to having like, a, like you know, like prototypical psychiatrists with uh, magazines in the waiting room to include <laughs> Alex or Advocate a magazine, et cetera. So in addition, I also think, OK, I got to prepare myself right. uh, before meeting some people. Um, I, I always try to do several checks on my assumptions. Mm -hmm. I try not to assume um, how people identify in terms of their gender um, based on how they look or how they sound. Right. I also try my best uh, to make sure that I don't assume how somebody would like to describe themselves right. in terms of their, um, um, their chosen names, perhaps, right. or preferred names, or um, in addition to what their pronouns of use are. Right. And also, I, I, I do my best to also not assume heterosexuality or being the sort of same gender as their sex uh, assigned at birth. If I can do those three things and I can remain curious about an individual, then I'm, I, I'm primed uh, to have a good time in the room, obviously, uh, but also allow a lot of space for young people especially to express more of themselves. Mm -hmm. Uh, so what happens in the room, I will often say, um, try to set the scene. Often introduce myself, hello, my name is Dr. Webster, I'm an adult psychiatrist, I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist, whatever it may be at the time. Um, I typically go by masculine pronouns, such as he, him, or his, with some notable exceptions during Provincetown visits, perhaps. <laughs> and um, how would you like to be right. referred to? What name should I call you? takes maybe 20 seconds yeah. at most, but you really establish that this is a place that we're going to be able to talk about these yeah. things, yeah. and I'm curious about these things yes. in this other person. So um, you also mentioned things like uh, confidentiality, yeah. rights to privacy, Roe yeah. v. Wade. 
Um, that is something that is quite critical. We have a lot of research yeah. that shows, especially for young people um, in pediatric settings, for example, um, that going over uh, rights to privacy and confidentiality and the limits of that around, for example, safety is critical yeah. if, you're, if you have any chance of hearing anything that a young person has to say. Um, so I'll often uh, go over what those limits may be, uh, but that also I'm really curious about uh, what's on their minds and uh, that we will keep all that we can in that That's space. Great. So that's a sort of general primer of how I try to create an open environment. I love that. I feel like you really, uh, really touched on, I mean, really made clear the, this curiosity. And I think that's an exciting uh, moment for thinking about, uh, especially other doctors listening to this, about that this is an opportunity to keep learning, right, and how to keep growing and getting to know patients in a, in a deeper way. I love curiosity and really thinking through privacy, especially with young people. Thank you. That's, that's wonderful. Um, it's a, it should really be, a, like it could be the next theme for pride, curious and private. Um, <laughs> Dr. Sari Reisner, you are an epidemiologist. Uh, you are an internationally known researcher right here on Longwood, right here in our backyard. <laughs> and um, you um, are particularly, I asked you to come here uh, because you really have your finger on the pulse about what's going on in the state of research. I want all the researchers listening to get excited about taking this on and give us some framework to the researchers about what does the field look like and what, what could, how could they get engaged with this? Yeah, absolutely. Can you hear me okay? Okay, great, perfect. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, really one of the things uh, you brought up the NIH um, Institute of Medicine report. Thank you so much. You brought up the Institute of Medicine report uh, in 2011, which was certainly seminal yeah. uh, for sexual and gender minority health. It actually was the time when the kind of terminology, sexual and gender minority SGM, kind of came into kind of more national attention. So, um, you know, so, and in that, the review of the science really was about the need for more data, right? Not just about us as LGBTQ people, but also what do we look like in relation to other populations? Um, what do we look like um, at the sort of margins of other identity groups? For example, uh, for those who are uh, living with an identity that's racial ethnicity, that's a minority, then looking at gender identity as a minority, looking at sexual orientation as a minority, and thinking about how those over, overlap and intersect. So one of the things that we do know is that we're, there are widespread disparities, you know, by all of the letters in the SGM acronym. Um, they are uh, in uh, HIV and STIs, in mental health, in substance use, cardiovascular disease risks, uh, a lot of uh, healthcare utilization, like avoidance of care behaviors, um, and uh, preventative screening, so, so not going to, to screening. And this is really hypothesized, and there are supporting um, you know, research projects talking about the role of stressors and minority stressors around stigma. And that's, you know, what you were talking about around uh, uh, really addressing and making that safe space for people so that when they come to care um, that they, they can feel comfortable in who they are. So, um, so the disparities piece, sometimes I feel like it's a real downer, you know, it's like disparities. <laughs> the doctors are here, right, not for the Everything's great. Yeah. They're here for what's what's wrong. What's exactly. Going wrong? Exactly. So we so we have these widespread disparities, you know. And I think that one of the one of the pieces is, you know, how do we think about a strengths based model? Right. Uh, is there a way that when we're talking about disparities, you know, the conversation moves to inequities? Like it's not the individual person's kind of fault, if you will, like that avoiding blame, uh, but rather thinking about strengths that we could build upon and how the systems that people are living in influence their health and well-being. You know? So um, I'm happy to say that one of the challenges is data collection, right? So we, in um, the, the first transgender probability sample or generalized um, population sample um, that we've had has been in the behavioral risk factor surveillance system in 2014. So those data have just come out in the last couple of years, really. And, and really that has been an under, you know, transgender, non-binary people have really been an under-researched uh, and, and, and the needs of that community are really uh, coming into greater clarity, you know, which is a really exciting, exciting thing. Um, and in fact, actually speaking of youth, the youth risk factor behavioral surveillance system added transgender to their 20, 
uh, 17, and they just released data. So 1.8% of the youth were identifying as 12 uh, as transgender, and another 1.2% were unsure. So there was questioning around gender. So in terms of thinking about young people, you know that this ha you know it's it's happening. There's a lot of young people, and as you were saying, uh, it is an exciting time. And I think the young people are conceptualizing like sex and gender and gender identity in different ways, you know, and have a completely different perspective than, for example, I do. <laughs> um, and it's very, you know, it's very exciting. So, so data collection has been like one of the barriers. And so now we have these data. So people who would love to do some research, there are available data, right? And to be able to use. And then there's also research to be done. Um, you know, there is a lot of information that we need about clinical models of care that work, that work well? What are the specific components um, that work well? How, uh, how, does the, how does the delivery of those components uh, compare if we deliver them in different ways? So, you know, really thinking about uh, the sort of building blocks around the research uh, and tying it and connecting it to clinical care uh, in the way that you were talking about. Um, I mentioned intersectionality, so that notion of thinking about multiple identities, and I think that really is uh, clearer and clearer. Some of the work that I do um, is around, I do a lot of HIV work, actually, infectious diseases work, and um, I've been doing that work for uh, for several years now. And, you know, we really do see in the U.S. overall that there is a racial disparity with black people being very much higher risk of HIV infection. And so perhaps then, unfortunately, it's not surprising that we see many black transgender women at the intersections of transphobia and racism also experiencing high burden you know so so those types of pieces and it, that's just one example and, and it's not at all to stereotype in any way it's simply to describe uh, the population distribution and we see other other challenges as well in mental health around other populations um, so uh, so yes uh, data collection as I mentioned also in clinical settings so this is an area I think that's very interesting I'm mean, the fact that HMS is right collecting data on yeah. students. I know. Yeah. Can We're we get excited about data. it? Data. The, data. Data. The hospitals, I, I'm just, I'm so proud. Um, you know, I said it's exciting to work on bathrooms. My other favorite meetings are with the IT, the chief information officers in hospitals, who are figuring out the very exciting ways to add fields to electronic health records. And I know all the doctors in the audience are about to start crying when I talk <laughs> about electronic health records. But this is at the core of what we are talking about. There's an expression, there's a saying, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And for those of you who have uh, ability to create forms, create uh, intake forms, create electronic health records, we're excited to find ways for you to allow people to self-identify their sexual orientation and gender identity and for it to potentially change over a lifetime as well. And getting that data is going to be really crucial. We can start to really understand what's happening. And what we can do better in a system, right? Once we, once we look at what is happening, that we can look at how we might change it if we need to, to improve yeah. care. Yeah. Um, I just there's just so many uh, exciting directions we could take this. I do want to be cognizant and see, see if there's some questions we might want to get to. Um, I have a hundred questions for these two. Are there any questions in the audience that this audience might want to ask? No, no question too big or too small. Yes. Yeah, start over. Okay. I'll repeat it if you want me yeah. to. Yeah, so um, two statistics that you s cited in your talk are that 20% um, of 18 to 34 year olds identify as LBGTQ, um, and that for the incoming class of HMS students, 15% identify as LBGTQ. And I was curious if you maybe had some insight onto <laughs> under like what maybe like causes this disparity, like, um, that because I'm assuming most incoming HMS students are between the ages of 18 and 34. <laughs> oh, I mean, maybe there are some that are older, but I was just maybe curious about, and, and from all of you, what the like, whether it's like that the culture of medicine is different or like more conservative or. Oh, you're you're tasking me that my percentage should be 20%. Well, you're saying <laughs> that my class here should be 20% LGBTQ. No, that's not at all what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I, I mean, what I'm saying is that maybe um, 
maybe the class is 20% LBGTQ, yes. but that there are other factors that yes. cause 5% of people to remain in the closet yeah. or haven't come I like, love haven't a I love a Harvard. What, yes, yeah. I think let's get into it. What's the what's the difference differentials in what we in the statistics? I, there's a lot of different ways I think we think about this. Um, our our deans here are the first to say when they repeat those statistics. They're the first to say, and we know that there are many students who still don't feel safe to or you know open to to check the box. So we do know that we probably have more than actually check the box. But I think it says a lot that that percentage. When I started here five years ago, that number was four percent. Um, I think that young people have changed in their in their identification in coming out younger uh, on on forms like this in general, and I think that Harvard has become a place where people know that they are safe and wanted, not just safe, wanted. And um, uh, so, what is left to do? I'm, I feel like as that's part of it is, I think the question that I'm going to put to these two faculty members is, what are some of the barriers in the profession? Mm -hmm of medicine for LGBTQ physicians and researchers? What are some of the barriers to success uh, for your career? I, I mean, I, I'd love for you to speak a little bit about that. I'm just gonna do that. All right, <laughs> we'll do this as well. Uh, let me also speak to that question yeah. very briefly as yeah, well. Um, Self-identification is one way of measuring, uh, but as, you, as we um, um, alluded to earlier, there are many different components to sexual orientation. So there's labels such as lesbian and gay, of course, but people may also experience same-sex sexual attraction. Um, they may also fantasize about people, um, and they may have had sexual behavior uh, that may be in line with those identities, but may not identify as such. Right, also, people's identity, uh, those things are very dynamic. So an 18-year-old may identify um, as straight, but then they could be 19 and they may be queer. Uh, they may be uh, 25 and they may become gay. Um, so we also have to recognize that those things shift as, uh, as well. So mm -hmm. keeping in mind that things can be a dynamic and having the space to be curious about that right. as well um, is, is vital. Um, related to that, uh, some of the challenges, so, so there are related challenges when it comes to being an LGBTQ physician as well, or having interest in these things. Um, so we don't have a great history of being able to measure these things. Um, Sometimes, like we, we're, we're certainly working a lot harder on these things than we had in the past, fortunately. Uh, but a lot of times our labels really just fall short, especially for younger people. Mm. I cannot tell you how often I am surprised in my room as I'm just casually talking with a young person. And I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I actually, I, I haven't asked you about uh, what sort of identities are important to you. And for somebody that I, I have made this sort of critical assumption that they may be heterosexual, I'm like, oh, well, I identify as bisexual. I'm like, oh, okay, well, uh, let's talk more about your ADHD perhaps, right? Um, but uh, it sort of points to that these things are very difficult to tap into. And related, uh, we don't have as much visibility when it comes to physicians. Uh, like, we, we don't have the same sort of mentorship that we may have over ADHD research um, or right. schizophrenia or other things like that. Right. Um, it's, it, we have to build upon those things. Also, uh, medicine has traditionally been quite conservative in many respects. Uh, we are catching up to this sort of cultural zeitgeist of holding LGBTQ identities closer to its heart. Uh, so we, we have some work to do in that regard in terms of people feeling comfortable to be more out, mm -hmm. as well as leaning into their identities or not um, as it relates to their clinical work. Like Not everybody yes. has to do this work. Um, you can be a, I think you said lucky lesbian, yeah. and also not have to do this yeah. work if you don't want to. Like yeah. Maybe you want to do something wildly different. Like there, We need ophthalmologists too. <laughs> Yay, ophthalmologists. <laughs> it's over here. Oh, yeah. Hi. Really? Is it on? Okay. Um, you can repeat it. Sorry. Good. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you for holding this forum. I really appreciate it. Um, I wanted to say I'm a research uh, administrator here at HMS, and so we handle a lot of hirings. And it, I was recently apologetically told by HR here that our hiring forms require that a person check a box as male or female. And it was apologetic because it's required. And it's required by two entities. It's required by the government for equal opportunity, and it's required by health insurance companies. Can any of you say anything about cultural changes within insurance companies and within the government that would alleviate these obstacles? Uh, the question was about the boxes that we are forced to check 
male or female, everywhere you go, check a box. Are you male or are you female? And the federal government requires all employers in the United States to report on race uh, and male and female and um, I'm sure other things but uh, that I'm not in charge of. Um, so the federal government requires it. Um, if a person uh, who comes to work here at Harvard does not identify as male or female, they do not have to check one of those boxes. We were told they did. Well, let me, I'll, <laughs> let me caveat that. I don't have to check that box. Someone in HR will. So it's a back of the house thing that happens. So for instance, uh, you get handed the form and it asks for you to fill out race. And I might not want to fill out, and, and I just might not want to fill out my race. I might not want to check male or female for different reasons. Unfortunately, in the back room in HR, someone checks the box. Um, my, our advice when uh, being welcoming and excited to bring in non-binary and transgender employees is to say on a piece of paper, the federal government requires us to collect the data in a certain way but we also collect it in this way. And we can create our own forms for our own internal systems that are separate from the federal government um, to keep track of people the way they want to be seen, right? So we can have two sets of forms. We can have where the federal government is today around that, and we can create um, a, a loving way to do that upon your first day of hire, right? No pressure. This is what's happening at the federal government level. But here at Harvard, our, our values are this, and this is what we care about. Tell me how you want to be identified. And that can be our own internal paperwork. We have work to do at the federal level, is the short answer. We have a lot of work to do at the federal level. Um, thoughts, yeah, Sarah? I mean, certainly the challenges around binary boxes are, are, are difficult. And I think, you know, we've had some uh, research doing measurement research to actually know what questions to ask, and that's been going very well. And uh, when you're talking about health insurance, yeah, that is a challenge because uh, uh, in some cases, uh, you know, to be able to access a certain procedure, if one, for example, wants a cervical or knee a cervical pap test for a transgender man who has a cervix and for some reason has an M, which one would, on, presumably on one's license or on one's health insurance, there are times when it wouldn't be covered, right? Because there would be a mismatch. Now, it, there's a way to call insurance companies and being a provider, one can advocate and one's medical staff, yeah. is, including, can advocate. But but that's an example of another system, as you're, as you're saying, where there are challenges and barriers. Um, and so when I mentioned stigma before, I mean, that is a sort of structural stigma, right? So when we understand the health of transgender and also SGM communities, we need to think about minority stressors that actually are occurring in people's lives. And that is, and that is certainly one of them. So thank you for bringing that up. One of my advice I always make in workplaces is, uh, in, in all moments, is when do you need to know? Do you really need to put that on your form, right? Like it's one thing when you're getting hired and you've got to fill out a, a social security form and all you got to add in those numbers. But for the vast majority of the time in the workplace, 99.99% .99 of the people you work with only need to know what your gender identity is. People do not need to walk around with their birth certificates letting everybody know what my sex assigned at birth was, right? You know me as who I am right now, right? And that's all that matters. So this, this stuff that we get into around the workplace, what are you, what's, where were you, where, 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 right? As a doctor, we love to think about the nuances of when do you need to know and what do you need to know. We love thinking about things like we've got wonderful researchers here working on anatomy-based health records, right? Gender, uh, male, female became a shortcut for talking about anatomy or screenings or tests or disparities. And now we're pulling away from that and saying, let's really think through anatomy, right? So we're looking at exciting ways to do, again, EHRs, where you can do anatomy inventories. What organs do you have? And as a doctor, I know what need, then what kind of screenings uh, to think about. But let's think about anatomy and organs and, and pull that away from uh, assumptions when we put a gender on it that I know what organs you have, right? It's exciting what's happening in medical schools. We're getting back to basics, people. It's an exciting time here at Harvard Medical School. What else? 
Hi, I'm Farah. I'm one of the uh, pediatric geneticists, and so sometimes I do have to talk about genes and chromosomes and all of those things. And I try to be really cognizant of saying, you know, parent one, parent two, parent one, donor. Um, and I work to do that, but I do encounter situations where a child identifies with a certain name or gender identity, and the parent repetitively in that clinic room refers to them to their birth name, which is different. And it's really tricky to navigate with ensuring that I still have that child's trust and assent to do further testing. So just thoughts on how to navigate that. Yeah, this is, this is actually a, not an unusual circumstance. It, it's something that happens quite often in my, in my clinical space where a child may be well ahead of their parents in terms of their chosen name, the pronouns that they like to use uh, or use, uh, as well as other sort of experiences of their gender as compared to their parents. Parents oftentimes need a lot of time catching up. Mm. Um, oftentimes they'll have young people uh, be very upset with their parents, like, uh, like, yeah, they keep calling me Paul, I don't know why they keep calling me Paul, and like, they keep calling me like he. Uh, but, but sometimes it can be really important to also uh, talk to children about, well, you know, how long have you been struggling with this? How long have you been thinking about this? How long have you uh, taken to get to where you are? Like, well, uh, you know, since fourth grade. So I'm like, okay, 10, 10 years? Uh, it's like, well, your parents have known for two weeks. Uh, <laughs> maybe they need some time to catch up, and perhaps they're going to need your help and my help in order to get there. Uh, but it does create scenarios where it can be very tricky. So I often do my best um, in those clinical spaces uh, when meeting with kids alone, asking what they prefer, um, and then also asking them, like, okay, well, your parents are going to come in shortly. Um, is there a difference between how you like to be referred to alone in this space versus with your parents? Um, what is it that you imagine um, your parents will say or think around these sorts of things? And this is also a really great opportunity to get a better sense of, uh, of a kid's environment. I, I'm always thinking about safety. Uh, so uh, if, if, there's a, if there's a kid and there's a difference between their gender and, and their sex assigned at birth, then there may be a greater risk of harm, assault, um, um, and other sort of very dangerous things. So we have, uh, again, a lot of research around that. But asking about what their experience of their family is, how safe do they feel at school, are there, um, are there religious communities that they feel really supported by, or does it create conflicts within them? Like these can give you a real sense of, of where the difficulties may lie, uh, may lie and also closely, closely align you with a, with a young person as well. It's not enough to be neutral about, mm -hmm. like, in the face of stigma and the face of prejudice. Um, that, that's inadequate. Like, those, uh, that neutrality may be seen as a condoning of, like, for example, parents using an inappropriate name. Uh, like, acknowledge it. Um, I also, I do a lot of apologizing as well in my <laughs> office. Sometimes I make it a gender wrong. Sometimes I may not uh, remember somebody's chosen name. So it's also really important to say, like, oh, I'm so sorry. I think I may have misgendered you uh, in the weeks prior to hearing about your chosen name or your pronouns. So apologizing, uh, keeping things in the room versus uh, with parents or el elucidating that, um, finding out more. It's hard, in short. <laughs> this is... I want to say um, what an honor it is to, to get to work with a medical community, a world of you are experts and you are seen by parents as such smart, important people in their child's life. You are seen as a real uh, high, right? You're, you're up here in a parent's mind. They really look to you. So Harvard Medical School and all of the affiliates that work here, all of the work that you're doing, your ability to be an advocate on behalf of a, of a transgender child or a queer child with that parent is going to go very far. What an incredible world it would be for that parent to see your comfort, your, your um, excitement about being a part of that child's uh, journey and, and affirmation. And I am telling you it will go so far with that parent to respond and pick up on what you're putting down. It will go really, really far. So you have a lot of power in that moment, just little moments around pronouns and names and what an impact that could make in that child's life. This is really important stuff, right? This medicine, the, the experience of our bodies, our most vulnerable moments, you have the power to really affect a positive change in so many people's lives. Um, I'm really thankful for that. Um, thank you. Yeah, what, what else? Other questions? Concerns, ideas. It's it's 
hopping in here. You can't see on the Facebook Live, but people are pushing each other away to the <laughs> microphone. You can't see it. Harvard, it's a... It's a so I'm actually going to go in a different direction. So I know you mentioned there were difficulties with data collection. Um, I work for research data management here at Harvard, so I'm interested if you could elaborate more on whether it's just collection of data or whether people are, aren't investing in the data or um, sharing of data, so if you could go more into that. Yeah, so I mean, I think there's several challenges um, in there, and they depend on the data structure that you're working in and, and where you are. So I was sort of talking about probability sample, generalizable kind of data structures, and there still are, are many studies that don't collect data, for example, on transgender status. The two that I mentioned do, <laughs> out of kind of all of them. So uh, sexual orientation, uh, we have more data that are being collected. There are questions that are included. So this I frame this often as inclusion in population surveys. Um, as we would with any other social determinant, right? We know uh, in terms of demographics. Um, so, uh, so there's that piece. Uh, in terms of uh, questions and asking questions, the kind of the approach people take that's been shown to be most effective is the two-step method, where we do ask people about their sex assigned at birth and their current gender identity. Um, and that way, uh, in some cases, that can avoid stigma, right? A person could say uh, that they have a discordant, if you will, sex assigned at birth and current gender identity, uh, and we would be able to see that in the in the data they wouldn't have to kind of like tell us outright um, so it depends on uh, the mode of delivery like a phone survey for example right it depends if it's in a patient encounter it so so there's a lot of the different considerations so I always say like every part of the design of any study or interaction where there are data being collected is going to have its kind of unique set of uh, considerations and so thinking through that uh, is the piece, I think, from a data perspective that you would need to do, depending on the system specifically that you're working in. But the take-home message is we can ask the questions. Uh, they don't offend people. Uh, I did a dissertation uh, on population measures for transgender health, and I used to joke that it was for, for people who were not transgender because we're concerned about measurement error, right, for people who are not transgender in terms of making sure that we are capturing the people that we want to be capturing. So um, that was also supposed to be a joke, but it didn't go over no, so well. Good, so it's good. Good. I got it. I got it. It was okay. good. It's um, a data joke. This is why I'm not a stand-up comedian. <laughs> Data, data jokes don't go over as well as, anyway. Um, yeah, so those are some of the kind of considerations uh, that I would say. And I'm happy to talk to you more about that after. Yeah. Great. I think we've got time for one more. One more? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for this great presentation. Um, so I do a lot of work in faculty development at Harvard Medical School, and I'm wondering what advice you have to bring our faculty along, because oftentimes I think the faculty are just afraid to do the wrong thing and um, advice you had would be appreciated. When you say do the wrong thing, can you elaborate on that? This is such a psychiatry moment. Can you, <laughs> can you elaborate on that? Say the wrong thing. So um, saying the wrong thing or um, just avoiding things in class when, well, you can probably talk yeah. about this. Um, when, when we're focusing, we're trying to teach pathophysiology um, and that's their focus and then they, faculty sometimes don't want to go somewhere else because they're not comfortable with the content. And it's not just LGBTQ, it's a lot of social disparities, lots of things like that. Yeah, this is a very, very common um, dilemma that many people face. Uh, so the first thing I'll start off by saying is that we all have to lean into that discomfort. Yeah. Um, there are sort of psychological processes, we can think about this very psychoanalytically, about these um, internal or um, unconscious anxieties that we have. Um, and oftentimes it gets translated into, oh, I may offend somebody, rather than, this is actually really uncomfortable for me. I'm usually in a position where I know what I'm talking about, I know what's, ho what's happening, I'm, right. I'm expert. an expert in this, but this is a time where I feel like I am not, and I feel a little vulnerable. Yeah. Therefore, we sort of translate in that, uh, to that, um, we translate that into, um, they may be uncomfortable, um, I may be, it, this may be seen as rude. Right. Uh, so I, I often bring up that. Like it doesn't happen just with uh, sexual orientation or gender. I, I, this happens all the time when people, anytime people start, start to whisper things like race or ethnicity. <laughs> I was like, well, I don't, I don't want to offend anybody. And I was like, well, we still have to ask about people's families and their lives. These are important elements to um, our patients. Um, there are, uh, there were a couple of relatively recent studies uh, that showed that 
oftentimes, especially LGBTQ youth and young adults, um, they don't want to have to um, educate their providers about their particular healthcare needs. Uh, they worry that they're not going to receive culturally competent care. And these are, I mean, that's a very public health matter. We need to be able to provide that. And on the other side, um, there was a, some study a long time ago, I think it was late 90s actually, uh, with the adolescent and pediatric medicine uh, clinic in DC. Uh, the physicians there were saying that they often didn't even incorporate elements of sexual orientation or gender uh, with these sort of uh, well child visits because they didn't know how to do that um, in, a, in, a, in a useful way. They didn't feel competent in it. And they also, one of the, one of the things that they listed is that they worried that they were gonna offend people. So um, there are sort of like a psychoanalytic ways of thinking about this. Yeah. There's a very public health way of thinking about this. It all comes to the same conclusion, of course, that we need to lean into our discomfort in order to provide adequate, culturally competent care. Wow. Yeah, please. How can I follow that up? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, I, what I was thinking was really uh, around that sort of gendered language. I mean, you're talking about pathophys, but I'm, I'm talking about sort of like you guys being in a space that, you know, you guys is such a common phrase. And um, I think that it's a difficult one for many reasons. Um, I know uh, uh, for, for women and also for transgender people, like it just can be very bristling the wrong way. And I think that's been one for me that, you know, I'm a junior faculty member, so there's also an issue of like, how do I approach, if there are other faculty members, how can I do this in a way that's, you know, um, deferential and kind and not seem like I'm critiquing. So that's another challenge just in terms of faculty levels. Um, but, but being able to say, you know, that this actually, let's try to not use that language together. You know, uh, I've gotten feedback from students, which I have, that that's really uncomfortable language. Um, so, or in whatever way that is said. But so in terms of the level, the level and the, the different issues that arise from that, I thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. I, I think our takeaways are leaning into curiosity and discomfort. Mm -hmm. um, it has been a wonderful pleasure to be with you all today. Keep your questions coming. If you've got them, see us privately. Otherwise, thank you all so much for being here today. Thank you. Everything you said. Y'all.